listening to Coffee and Conversation with Recovery Advocate Network, the nonprofit organization that strives to address the staggering disparity in resource availability for individuals suffering from mental health disorders, processing disorders, addictions, trauma healing, and sexual identity challenges. Together, we strive to end the stigma associated with these challenges so that true healing can begin. Welcome back to Coffee and Conversation with Recovery Advocate Network. I'm your host, Anne, and welcome you to episode number 45. Today's guest is Karen, and she shares her experience, strength, and hope in the form of sharing her life struggles with physical, emotional, and sexual abuse, drugs and alcohol, violence, domestic abuse, eating disorders, family challenges, and hard decisions she's had to make to best love and care for her son. This episode also mentions suicide. So if these topics are sensitive to you, we encourage you to listen to this episode in a safe and supportive environment. Now, in addition to those challenges, Karen also shares the hard work she has done to turn her life around and truly live a life worth living. Her story is so inspiring and should give hope to people at all stages of the recovery story. This episode is also powerful if you're supporting someone who is struggling, and we mentioned several educational resources that can help you learn how to be the best support system and advocate possible. Several parts of this episode made me sad. Some, my heart swelled with love, my heart beamed with pride for Karen, and my whole body jumped for joy at the healing occurring in the moment. I am very, very grateful to have had the honor to, honor to participate in this story. Now, enough of this. Let's do it. But first, let's remember our three C's rules of engagement. One, click that subscribe button and the notifications button so you don't miss future episodes. Two, commit to staying for the full episode. I mean, really, there's so much hope and healing at the end, and I love her quote at the end, so don't miss it. And of course, then you can also find out how you can register for the free prize that you can potentially get. Okay, finally, our third C. What is our third C? Of course, it's coffee. So fill up your coffee, sit back, relax, and let's get started. Good afternoon, listeners. This is Anne, your podcast host, and I'm very excited for today because today is like a really, really brave moment. I think um, I'll share one thing. I have parts of my life story that I started writing on a very secret website. Only a few of my friends know the link to the website, and I've written it journal-wise that I think one day I'm going to write this book. And it's the parts of my background, some of my severe childhood abuse and trauma and things that have happened that I thought, I don't want the world to know about until certain people in my family have passed away or are gone or no longer in my life. So I've had these secrets. Now, slowly through this podcast, listeners, you've heard almost the majority of, of that over these 40 something episodes. But I remember peace and hope to others and to continue to have healing for myself, but being fearful of judgment and hate and fearful from like other family members and how they would feel and things like that. And so it is, um, it's, ex- I'm extremely appreciative when individuals who have really challenging life stories are brave enough to say, Hey, I'm, I'm going to come on board and maybe share just a tidbit or maybe share a lot of their stories. Who knows? So we're not sure what all we're going to talk about today, but I am excited to have my new friend, Karen here to tell her story. And now I'm going to stop talking. And Karen, I'm going to let you just introduce yourself and start telling us why are you here today? I'm Karen. I'm an alcoholic. I'm anorexic and I'm bulimic. Um, I've been sober for 24 years as of December 8th. 
Um, but my primary addiction is food. At the age of seven, I was 170 pounds and my lowest weight has been under 40 pounds seven times in my life. There's parts of my story, well, a lot of my story that my son doesn't know. To this day, he doesn't talk to me and he's been told a lot of lies about my life and why I gave my mother legal guardianship to raise him. Um, so I come from a very abusive background. My mother was an alcoholic. My father was an alcoholic. There was a lot of physical, sexual, and emotional abuse that I got that my sister didn't get. I learned how to vomit from my mother. I learned about laxatives from my sister and... Um, at the age of 16, I was kicked out and, uh, I moved in with some friends and I had already graduated from high school and, uh, I took a half a year off to work and, um, my mother bribed me by saying she would buy me a car if I would start eating. Um, my sister resented that because she was older than me and didn't have a car of her own. Um, at the time, my parents were divorced, but my father would come in and out of our lives. When my mother divorced my father, he divorced me and my sister and married a mail order bride. And he came back in my life and bribed me with a trip to Mexico, which I took my sister on. And she was like the police, you know, watching my every move, telling on me if I didn't eat. And, you know, I would play the games. Um... I didn't get into drugs until I graduated from university and moved to California. And at the time I came to California to go to an eating disorder facility. I lived out here when I was younger and knew I wanted to come back because it was too cold in Toronto. Um, I'm very intelligent, I'm very smart. Sometimes I think I'm too smart for my own good, but I didn't talk to my family for over 20 years until um, I got into a lot of abusive relationships and I was living in the valley, walking to the supermarket. I was putting on a benefit for eating disorder awareness and um, was selling my baking at the supermarket and I was walking to the market when a car grabbed me, when a guy pulled over, grabbed me at, at knife point, threw me in my his car and raped me. Um, I was 19. He threw me in a trash can. I don't know how I found my way home, but my neighbor was already was uh, was a crackhead and introduced me to cocaine. Um, at the beginning, I didn't use it a all the time and then I got involved with the wrong people um, they sold me for money and my life went up in smoke when I was 23 years old I got pregnant I had an abusive boyfriend and I gave birth to a stillborn a year later he was thrown in jail a little while later I was date raped and um, I got pregnant again, even though the doctor said I would never carry to term and one of us would die. They told me I miscarried. I didn't miscarry when I was uh, five months pregnant. They told me I was three months pregnant. Then they told me I was going to have kidney and liver failure. I was scheduled to go back to Toronto in August the 20th of, of 1999 so that I can get clean and sober. And I had been in the hospital for three days um, because my legs had swollen up. I didn't know that I was in labor. And they took an ultrasound and told me that they didn't tell me I was in labor. They kept sending me home. And one day I was, uh, one night I just, 
August 17th, I just, I couldn't lie down. I couldn't sit up. I couldn't move. I uh, didn't use any drugs for days prior, except for an Ambien because I thought I was having liver failure. And I got up and I went to the bathroom and I started pushing and pushing and I pushed until I heard a baby cry. I almost flushed the toilet and then I heard my son cry. Um, I screamed for help. I was living with an old lady who was like an adopted grandmother. She called the paramedics. My ex had gotten out of prison and was the one that cut my son's umbilical cord. The paramedics told me that I, my son what, didn't make it, which I didn't believe. I was taken to the hospital and because I had Ambien in my system, my son was given to the state, which was the biggest blessing because had he not been taken from me, I can't say that I would be sober today. Um, I had an option to go into a recovery center that allowed reunification with your child, but it was in a bad area. I wasn't ready, so I left the next day. My son was born August 17th of 99. My birthday is August 18th, so God had a sense of humor. Um, <laughs> when my son, my son was in the neonatal care, and one day when I showed up to see him, even though I knew he was a product of rape, I was afraid that every time I saw him, it would remind me of the guy that raped me. Um, he, he looked exactly like me, and uh, when I showed up at the hospital, he was gone. They had put him in foster care, and when because I'm Jewish, she had to have a, a bris. So my mother set it up from Toronto. When I called to tell her I was pregnant, she didn't believe me. She thought I was lying because she had bought me plenty of tickets to come back to Toronto and I never showed up. But this time when I called and told her I had the baby, she tried to set up for me to go to a rehab. And I, I, I wasn't ready yet, and when he had his bris and was crying, the social worker took me. Um, that was when I had my first spiritual experience, when he went to the foster mom. And when the social worker dropped me off, she said, I know you'll get sober when you're ready. And when I got out of the car, I started screaming to God, God, help me. I'm so sick and tired of being sick and tired. I'm ready. And for a week, every day, someone drove me to the rehab, but I couldn't walk in until December the 8th of 99. I was so sick and tired of being sick and tired and sick and tired of being in abusive relationships that I had my friend come and pick me up. And I said, I'm going to stay in bed until you show up at the door. And I didn't use from December 7th at midnight. So December 8th is my sobriety date. I walked into Beit Teshuva and my life started. I haven't used since then. Um, but my eating disorder has always been in play. That's something that I still battle with, but I'm not active. Um, if I get stressed out, I lose a lot of weight, like it's going out of style. To this day, my son still doesn't talk to me. He thinks I abandoned him because my sister told him I did. My sister is very evil. Proof in point was on August 28th of this year. My On August 27th of this year, my mother was really sick. I didn't know. I got a call from my aunt telling me I needed to call my mother because she was dying and she probably would die in the next couple hours. I reached out to the hospital. My sister answered the phone. I said, put mom on the phone. She said, you can't talk to her. I said, I don't care what you say, put her on the phone. And my mother wasn't really coherent, but I said, mom, I love you. I'm sorry. And I forgive you. And then 12 hours later, she was dead. My sister never called to tell me she died. I called the hospital the next morning at 6 a.m. and That's how I found out. My sister kept me, my uncles, and my aunt 
my mother's brothers and sisters all away from the funeral. To this day, I haven't gotten a chance to say goodbye to my mom. And to this day, my son still won't speak to me. Even after 24 years sober, even after building a business, a successful company from the ground up in an industry I had no interest in going into, I am a very honest and loyal person, but why my sister chose to be so cruel when I'm the total opposite, I'll never understand. <laughs> I just hope one day my son learns the truth and chooses to forgive me or to talk to me or to give me a chance to explain. That's all I've got. Karen, um, wow, I wish I could just give you a virtual hug. Well, I am giving you a virtual hug. I wish I could give you a hug in real person. And I'm not a hugger. So I have so many thoughts about your story. Um, one thing I want to say, listeners, is we talk about so many of these challenges. I mean, that story is so brave. I am so proud of you. Um, okay. We talk about the link between childhood trauma and addiction in episode 13. And in reading the book, The Body Keeps a Score, I think when I had, you know, several things I've said repeatedly in my life because I grew up with severe childhood abuse, um, sexual abuse as well for years for my brother that stopped when I attempted suicide when I was 13. I have such a heart for individuals who have all these struggles and then have severe addictions and especially the ones that then figure out how to come out. Because I know without a shadow of a doubt, when I was 15 in high school and super struggling, I fell into all of the traps that a young girl who had no love at home and severe abuse would fell into. And I remember walking into the bathroom and seeing the girls shooting up. And I think my one piece of luck at that stage is that I knew that if I shot up, I would become addicted and I would probably end up being a prostitute dead on the side of the street. Like that would be my story. And I also am very intelligent. And so when I think about that myself, I get very frustrated when individuals look at someone and they hear a story, especially when they hear a story of repeated sexual abuse encounters you know, I, Karen, I don't think you know my story, but I was kidnapped and held hostage in August of 2020 and held hostage for five days. And during that time was being prepared to be sold into the sex trade and have had multiple instances of, of sexual challenges and trauma. And sometimes people, if they don't know the science behind it, they're like, oh, well, it must be that person because why does that person have all of those bad things happen to them? You know, the common denominator is that person. Well, no, just take time. Listeners, if you're thinking about that, um, first of all, okay, fine. It may seem like it's common sense. It's not, but it may seem like it is. So I don't, I don't want to say this as if I'm judging you because I also thought that of myself. I thought it must be me. Something is wrong with me. I am flawed. I, I am a failure for these reasons. Okay. That is what I thought. And, and the reality is, is that just when I read, so Karen, I read The Body Keeps the Score when I was in what I call eating disorder camp for anorexia. And I read that book and I highlighted almost the whole book. I cried during, I have like notes all over the place because it was finally where I was just like, this is me. This is my story. Of course, I would go through these struggles. Of course, I would have struggles with addiction. I would have struggles with marriages and intimacy and relationships and divorce. And I lost my first child was stillborn as well. And that was incredibly devastating for me. And while I have a phenomenal relationship with my daughter now, I have a special needs daughter and I am super lucky in that she, she still thinks I'm like amazing and perfect. And I'm not, I, I am pretty amazing, but I'm definitely not perfect. <laughs> Um, but I have zero relationship with the majority of my family. And, you know, I was talking to someone once, Karen, about it because I said, if you look at my family, I'm really the only person who 
has really ever sat and tried to give back to society and try and be a good human and make a positive impact on the lives of others. And someone said, and I, I said, why is it that my family that I've completely just separated from almost every single member of them? Because it was a healthy decision for me. And maybe we'll have a relationship one day. And I wish them absolutely the best. But um, I said, why is it that I feel as if I'm being cast as if I'm the black sheep of the family? And one person said to me one time, have you ever thought about the fact that maybe, maybe you are the white sheep born amongst black sheep? And I thought that's a powerful statement because I don't really want to say that they're black sheep, but I don't want to categorize myself as being less than because because we don't, uh, my views of life don't align with their views of life. And so I just, I just want to tag some of those things in, in your story. I mean, when I was listening to it, I just, you know, especially the, the drive by when the person grabbed you and that happened, it was, I was remembering the day that I was kidnapped. And I think if you you just never experienced that amount of hopelessness And I dealt with that afterwards by doing a lot of drinking. So I went to rehab afterwards. And then I went to eating disorder camp because if I couldn't drink, then I wasn't going to eat. So I just stopped eating. And I just learned myself trying to find ways to just stop the pain and stop the nightmares. And, and, you know, I, like you, figured out those were not the best ways to do it. But wow, that many. Oh, and by the way, my birthday is August 20th. So. Mm -hmm. A couple of Leos here in the room. So I guess, you know, one thing I just want to pause for a minute. How 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 do you feel hearing me share some of those things from kind of my perspective after you sharing your story? What resonates with you? I, I also sometimes think, how come so much bad has happened to me? And then I look at my sister and I say, how come she never suffered anything compared to what I suffered? Is, is my life only about suffering? Am I never going to find happiness? And even when I met my husband, you know, it was like he swept me off my feet and he was seven years sober, but then he relapsed out of jealousy and did things to me that I still, to this day, um, haunt me. But when he got, we separated and I threw him in jail because he tried to strangle me in a blackout. And um, when he got sick, when he was diagnosed with cancer, I stepped up and I took care of him. And I was still working full time, but I was his caretaker. I was his power of attorney. And, you know, they said he was going to beat it, the cancer, and he didn't. And I was there, I had to sign the DNR, I had to tell him to stop fighting, that I would be okay. And I had to tell him I forgave him for everything he did to me. But I still, to this day, you know, I mean, I get into these relationships that are so unhealthy and and I think it stems all the way back to my childhood and I'm gonna be starting EDMI the trauma therapy, because I really need to, because I want to find a guy that treats me the way I deserve to be treated, the way that I believe I treat, I treated my husband to the very end, even when he was doing horrible things to me, I defended him until it got to the point where I couldn't defend him anymore. And when we weren't supposed to see each other because of a restraining order against him, I gave him another chance. And he lied to me about his drinking throughout that time, but I knew he was sick. And that's what made me step up and I talked to my sponsor at length about it. And she said, that's because you're a good person. And you stepped up because it was the right thing to do even when he didn't want you to take care of him, he just wanted to die alone. You wouldn't let that. And, you know, even with my sister, I try, I try calling her. I try being loving, but she's always, you know, 
put try to put me down even though i you know she's jealous because i'm thinner than her i don't look like my dad um i look like my mom who was drop dead gorgeous i I moved 4,000 miles away. I went after my dream. I don't rely on, I didn't marry for money. I married for love, whereas she married for money. And, you know, she tried to adopt my child. She tried to take my son away from my mother. And, you know, when I found out that she raised him from the age of 11 because my mother almost lost her eyesight, I was told I could throw my sister in jail because they kidnapped him without my permission. And I didn't do that to her because of my son. But yet she's still a conniving evil B-I-T-C-H that I wish would just suffer a little bit of what I have to see what it's like to go through life and have to fight for everything I have to have to really work. She doesn't know what it's like because she has everything handed to her on a silver platter and she always has. She's always been my mother's favorite. I may have gotten the car, but she never got abused. Every time I went back to visit my mother, the police were called because she would beat me in a blackout. Up until seven years ago. So... So I have a question. I have a couple of questions I was thinking about. One, I, I can relate to the, the struggle and the challenge of the sibling part. So, you know, my one of my struggles was that from what I know, and I don't know, maybe maybe my mother who's still out there will listen to this podcast and I don't know, maybe she'll leave a comment and say, I don't know what I'm talking about. But um from what I understand, she very much didn't like herself. And so she did not want a girl. And so I had three si- three uh, brothers. She had two sons. So I I guess I should have said at that point I had two brothers and neither of my brothers were abused and I was severely abused. I mean, my eating disorder came from the fact that she used to make me watch my brothers eat and I would have to stand there and watch them eat. And I learned at a very young age that if I'm not hungry, she wasn't hurting me. And so I learned these coping mechanisms because, okay, I can not eat. And that is a coping mechanism for this pain that this individual is giving me. Right. Okay. So, um, and then when, you know, my parents got divorced and, and things happened, there was just so much struggle with me and my siblings because they were not abused. And I was severely, severely abused, you know, locked in the basement, made to stay up at night all night long. Like, you know, so much physical abuse. Um, my nose broken so bad. I've had three nose surgeries, just awful. And they were never abused. And that I think has also been a lifetime struggle in our relationships together is there's so much inherent anger and like bitterment and resentment from and, and lack of understanding in those areas because their childhood was not the same childhood that I had. We may have grown up in the same household, but we absolutely did not have the same childhood. And I think in hearing you, Karen, what you're saying is, is that this is not, I mean, this is a, a, a relatively, sadly, it's a relatively common story in, in families with abuse in these situations. And, and also, you know, going into repeated um, uh, what do I want to say? Ab- abusive relationships or bad situations like those, the things we learn at a very young age, once again, listen to episode 13, read the book, The Potty Keeps a Score. There's so much science behind it. This is not a victim mentality, listeners, that we're saying this, like, woe is us? Like, this is our excuse for X, Y, and Z. That is absolutely not the case. There is so much science behind it. And I think if you're going to do anything to try and and learn more about society and help individuals be their best individuals, you can learn about those two areas. And so I think in, in understanding those pieces then also, I think that my, my question that I have to you, because I could see how I might do a similar thing. So an example being is that I, you know, when I, I traveled, I did a study abroad in China for a month and let my dad and my stepmom watch my daughter for a month. 
And I kind of like question myself now because my, my dad was actually a great grandfather. Great. A horrible dad to me. Phenomenal. Great. A, a grandfather. So, and I, so my question, my mother. Yeah. My question to my you ties to that. My mother treated my son like gold. Yeah. She went to all of his events. She, he was the light in her life. She, he was her reason for living. And he never got hit. I mean, I think in, in, in foster care, he was abused. But once my mother got him, he was her pride and joy. He was, he is the man he is today because of the way my mother raised him. And we are the same, me and him. This, my mother used to say the same mannerisms. He looks like me except in a boy's body. He's very tall. I'm five foot four. He's six foot something. But that comes from the guy that raped me. Um, he was blonde hair, blue eyes when he was born. I'm dark. I'm Auburn, you know, this is my natural hair color, but, and I have hazel eyes, but we have the same mannerisms, the way we talk to my mother, the way we used to sit in front of the TV and eat when I was younger. I mean, my mother didn't want to believe I had an eating disorder until I passed out in the mall. And was rushed to the hospital. She was in full denial. And. You know. And then. And then she would try and force me. And then lock the bathroom. Or whatever. And I always found a way. Because I learned it from her. But with my son. It was like night and day. He never had his. A, a finger lifted on him. He was given everything. He That a. A, a child could ever want all the love in the world. She didn't even date be, when he was younger, just because he was the focus of all her attention. And also my sisters, because for many years, my sister, before she got married and even before she had a child, and then her husband would only let her have one child. So she wanted mine too. My son was the first grandchild. So my son was the apple of my mother's eye. And my son was very close to her. And even though at the beginning he used to call her mama, he knew that she wasn't his mother. He pointed at a picture of me and said, this is my mother. When for at a very young age, I flew him out here when he was six years, when we were celebrating our birthday and he was turning six and they were so afraid of someone slipping and telling him that I was his mother. And then when he got back to Toronto, he's, he's born in the United States. He's a dual citizen, but they told him, they took him to therapy, but they lied about his father. They said his father died in the war, was a war hero, like why lie to a child about his, you know, that's one of the main reasons why, even though I didn't want to do the podcast because he doesn't know my story, I'm doing it because he's been told so many lies about me that if he does watch this, maybe he'll know the truth is that my sister's been lying about me for years. I didn't abandon him. I gave him the best life I could give him with the tools I had at the time. I needed to get my life on track. I needed to get sober. I needed to get a foundation. I didn't want him raised in, enter in Hollywood around all the entertainment. I wanted him to have a normal childhood. And be able to have the choose the life that he wanted for himself, even though I work in entertainment. I wanted him to to know what love was from my mother that didn't give me that, never gave it to me up until the day she died. I always felt like my mother hated me, and she did. And my father was non-existent from a very young age. He would show up when I was in the hospital and disappear a couple of days before I got out. My sister and I used to be very close when we were kids. Now 
it's doc it's like oil and water because she's very jealous of me for some reason and she's the one that has the life that's easy i'm the one that has had to go through all the struggles i'm the one that had to get that was raped and thrown in a garbage can and don't know how it was going to make it home. I was left in a in a dark industrial area, held at night at gunpoint, kicked in the stomach when I was pregnant with my son by some other maniac that grabbed me from in front of my apartment where I was sitting. And luckily someone heard me screaming so loud at two in the morning that the the silence the sirens is what saved my life and luckily my son didn't die but my son doesn't know any of the truth because my sister has lied to him his whole life i hope my my reason for wanting to do this is so that maybe he will see this and realize that what he's been told about me all these years are just lies. That I never abandoned him. I wanted him to have the best life. And that I have tried. I have sent him money. N never got to him. I have sent him cards. I have sent him birthday cards every year. I have tried to call him. I have left him messages. I have asked my mother when I was in Toronto, I tried to see him. He refused because of my sister. My mother was my only link to my son and now she's gone. Listening, like if he's listening right now, what exactly do you want to say to him? I want him to give me a chance to explain and to know that I never, that I always loved him, that I only gave my mother legal guardianship because I needed to get my life on track. I needed to get well. And Unfortunately, I was in a rehab that didn't allow children. I had him every weekend until he was one years old, until I gave my mother custody. But I never lost my parental rights. Because I've been sober since the first day I entered the program. I think one of the things that I will say, being a mother, um, so, so for example, I, I, before I became a mother, I used to actually say I, for years, I was like, I never want to be a mother. Okay. And then I wanted to be a mother more than anything and spent years of infertility treatment. And then my first child through infertility treatment was stillborn. And I was so mad at God. I was just like, are you freaking kidding me? I had a horrible mom who was like brutally abusive, did not deserve to have kids. And yet I can't have kids. Right. And then I, I finally had my daughter. And I will say this is that um, I, I wish that when I was born and my mother was not in a state to provide love, care, and support for me, I wish I had been adopted out to some people who wanted to take care of. I had the same. I, I also, I used to pray that I would be adopted when my parents were beating me and I ran away, I tried to go into foster care. When the teachers noticed all the scars and I used to have to wear long sleeves in the summer. And then my parents pretended like they were the perfect parents. I mean, I used to pray that maybe I would find out that my parents weren't really my parents. Oh my gosh, was... Karen, okay, I have to tell you the story. <laughs> I love this. this is all going to be online. Um, okay. So I, exact same thing. I thought, okay, maybe I can understand why my dad has this like hatred for me. There were these rumors that maybe my mom had had an affair and he thought maybe I wasn't his. So years, years ago, I thought, wait, uh, my uncle has done Ancestry.com. So if I do Ancestry.com, because I tried to think, how can I figure out whether or not he's really my dad? Maybe he's <laughs> not. And then I'll feel better about the fact that I just don't feel like he ever loved me. Okay. And so <laughs> I, I did Ancestry.com. And Karen, I remember I was like opening it up and I was like, please don't show. And then it showed my uncle as my uncle. And I was like, ah, darn it. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, well. <laughs> but I will say that, you know, I, so I want to say the other thing is this. Um, so I, I think being a mother, not having the skills, the environment, the place, all of those things to care and love for your child, having the courage to allow that child to be in an area that they're going to be loved is, is, is got to be the hardest thing ever. And uh, I wish that my mother had been that brave. Um, I don't know how my life would have been different and had it, right? And so that I want to say that as, as one thing. And, um, oh my gosh, I got so passionate about that. I had a second point and now I completely forgot what my second point is. Okay. But I do want to say that. Well, and then the other point will come to me. Another time. We can do this again another time. <laughs> well, what was the, uh, it was really, uh, oh my gosh. Oh, well. Well, now, now listeners, you'll see when, when people think I'm not speechless and sometimes, sometimes I am speechless, but I, I do want to say, I, th- I think that that, that is, is really, really, oh, I know what I was going to say. Got it. Okay. The other thing is I will say that when I, when I became a mother, when I, when my daughter was born, motherly love for her. I could never have abused her, never have done any of the things my mother did to me. me and so I will say that it has allowed a certain point of, of healing for me. And that I know that my mother must have had so many mental health challenges because it's just against natural, just the natural thing about being a mother or being a father that really is allowed me to have, I don't want to have a relationship with him. However, it's allowed me to find some peace, a little bit of grace in that, because I just think that nature is, I mean, you know, nature is to love and care for your offspring because they're the next generation. And I think when that doesn't happen, there are inherent mental health challenges that I can at least look back and it's brought me peace. I have less anger. I have less resentment towards them. I've been able to, over the years, slowly let go of more and more of those things. And actually over the years, slowly been able to say, okay, wait, it wasn't me because children are not born flawed. You know, I wasn't born, I mean, I was abused from the day I was born, right? I wasn't born with anything wrong with me. And quite frankly, at you know, 48, I'm 48 now. At 48, I think I'm pretty great now. <laughs> so it is, it is what it is, right? And so I will say, I feel really grateful that God allowed me to be a mother and allowed me to go through so many of these journeys and come to the other end. And there are so many things I'm still struggling with and I'm still working on. And I think if anyone says they're not struggling with something and they're not working on something, they're lying to themselves and probably everyone else. <laughs> but um I will say that some of those, the gifts of just realizing that they had their struggles and some of the individuals in my family that I'm in conflict with, I mean, I literally, I've, I've learned that I constantly now try and every day just pray for their peace and their healing. And when I do that in the morning and think about that, I, every day I feel a little bit less resentment and a little bit less because I really want them to have great, phenomenal, peaceful lives. I don't feel like I need to be, you know, my situation is different from yours, right? Because I have a relationship with my child and I don't have to have a relationship with my siblings and my dad, right? So I can, I can say, I, God, I want the absolute best for them. I want them to be happy. I want them to enjoy lives, their lives the best that they can. And I don't have to be a part of their life and they don't have to be a part of mine. And we can all go our separate ways and enjoy life to the fullest. And that's what I want for everyone at this stage of where I'm at my healing. I agree with that. And I heard a speaker last night that said, if I just remember that they're spiritually sick, my sister my mother, my father, then I just have to remember that that's why they did what they did. That they didn't have the tools. My mother didn't have the tools to to know any better. She was probably, you know, she was raised in a very hard 
with very hard life, even though she was a beauty queen and everything. And even though I've had really bad relationships, even with my husband, you know, relapsing and stuff, I still believe that my person is out there and that I will find that love and that one. I don't, I don't close the door on that. I know what I want. I know what I'm looking for and I'm not willing to settle for anything less. I'm not looking for a guy to take care of me. I'm looking for true love and I believe it's out there. I haven't given up on that. And people would think that I was crazy because of all the shit I've been through. Like, you know, being raped and losing my virginity. I don't judge every guy based on what one sick human being did to me or two sick human beings did to me. You know, those were acts of violence. Just like when I was... 13 years sober and I was in a gas station in broad daylight and I got beaten almost to death by a gang member for being at the wrong place at the wrong time. I don't think that every African American or Latino is violent like that person was. I don't judge a whole ethnicity based on what one violent person did to me. Just like because I've been in unhealthy relationships doesn't mean I've given up on love. I just know that my ticker is broken and I have to take a little time and really, you know, get to know a person and see if they're psychotic or whatever. Like my last boyfriend, total liar, red flags all the way, but I ignored them. And when I finally broke free was the best thing. He still tries to contact me and he contacted me a couple days ago and I told him if he didn't leave me alone, I was going to call the police and he lives in Arizona. So, but I still believe my person is out there and that I will find that true love. That one person that fills my soul, not, makes me whole because two two halves don't make a whole. I'm a whole person and I'm very satisfied within myself. I'm very secure within myself and I have self-esteem and self-confidence and I'm not looking for a one night stand. People always judge me based on my body and looks. They don't think I have a brain. Boy, they aren't they don't know I also have a mouth on me. <laughs> but I'm too honest for my own good, but I believe that I do that because in business, that's the best way to be. And that's why I have the career that I have because I am honest and I don't burn bridges and I don't step on toes and I don't, you know, take advantage of people. Whereas so powerful. Like so powerful. And talk about just nailing all of the stereotypes out the water. I mean, I just, oh my gosh, my heart is exploding. Okay. So a couple of things as we wrap up today, Karen, is there anything, okay, two things. First, is there anything you really wanted to, to tell the audience we haven't covered yet, especially maybe if there's someone listening that has a story similar to yours, is there any type of encouragement or something? Or if there's someone, you know, who's maybe judging someone in that realm, I don't know. Is there something that you want to share? And then I hope you remember to bring your favorite motivational quote. So those are the two things we want to if, do. If someone is struggling with drugs or alcohol or food, please get help. I've watched too many people I care about die. And even though I've lost a lot of weight in the last couple of months, it's from stress. It's not from starving myself. I take care of myself. I work out. And all I can say is it's one day at a time. It's, you know, live life to the fullest. And if you, if you, if you're thinking of suicide, trust me, 
don't kill yourself. You're killing the wrong person. And you don't get a second chance when you kill yourself. I've watched a lot of people I care about that have committed suicide in the last couple of months. And it kills me because they never got to know themselves when they were sober. And there's so many people struggling out there. Get my number. Call me. Reach out. If you're struggling with an eating disorder, if you're struggling with addiction, I will help you. I will guide you the way I've been guided. That's all I got. And listeners, if you email us at podcast at recoveryadvocatenetwork.org and you would like to be connected with Karen, then we will facilitate that connection offline. And then, um, okay, Karen, what is your favorite motivational quote? Oh, before you say it. Okay, something you just said that I love. So when I interviewed Dr. Constance in about his book, 52 Weeks Being Mindful, one of the quotes in his book was, every life matters, including yours, start acting like it. So I think that ties to exactly what Karen just said. For anyone listening who's waiting for tomorrow to take care of yourself, you only live once, your life matters, start acting like it. Okay, Karen, what is your favorite motivational quote? Fill your heart with love. Oh my God, I love that. This has been so amazing. You are so brave. I just, I am so glad we had the opportunity to have this conversation today. Me too. Thank you. It was very healing. Oh, that just, now I'm going to cry. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today with your coffee and conversation. We hope you've been encouraged and learned something from today's story. To learn more about today's guest, please check out our show notes for more details. Now it's time to remember to like this episode, subscribe, and turn on your notifications to ensure you do not miss future episodes. Recovery Advocate Network envisions a world where individuals with mental health challenges receive comprehensive and effective treatment without the worry of financial burdens to themselves or their families, all without the stigmas often present in society. We are proud that every individual work with RAN does so on a 100% volunteer basis. You can support the mission by making a financial donation via PayPal or Venmo, or email donate at recoveryadvocatenetwork.org if you would like to donate items for our next fundraising auction. Please visit our website at www.recoveryadvocatenetwork.org to learn more. Now, stay in the loop about upcoming events, future episodes, and more by following us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter X, TikTok, LinkedIn, and all major podcast platforms. As a reminder, the experiences and advice expressed in this episode are the hosts and guests' own personal stories and do not represent the opinions of any organization mentioned. RAN is passionate about opening the doors for all voices and experiences, not just those expressed in any particular podcast. If you want to share your experiences or expertise, we encourage you to be a future guest by emailing us at podcast at recoveryadvocatenetwork.org or submit a blog by emailing blog at recoveryadvocatenetwork.org. We also encourage you to comment on the episode so that we can continue to provide content that is most beneficial to the community. How do you do that? Visit our website at www.recoveryadvocatenetwork.org and in the top right corner, click that comment button and comment. So listeners, what do you need to do? Pause what you're doing, subscribe, follow us. Please give us a like and a five-star rating write some meaningful comments, and most importantly, share these episodes with your friends. You never know whose heart you will touch, so please be a part of a reason someone has new hope today. If this episode is triggering to you, we encourage you to contact your support system, therapist, national and community support groups, the Global Crisis Text Line by texting 741-741, and or if in the U.S., dialing 988 to reach the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. If you're in the U.S. and need additional resources such as shelter, support group resources, transportation, food, 
and or a safe, confidential path out of physical or emotional domestic abuse, please call 211 or visit www.211info.org for assistance. Now, we know you are very busy and we are grateful that you said yes to sharing time with us today. If you stuck to our three C's of engagement and listened to the full episode, then visit the podcast section of our website and leave the comment about the podcast and you'll be entered to win an autographed copy of one of the books from one of our book club series, as well as a coffee and conversation coffee mug. So thanks again. Until next time, back to your coffee.